And we continue at 2.08 in the afternoon. Talk Radio 790 KABC, the John Phillips Show, broadcasting live from the Morongo Casino Resort and Spa Living Room Studios. Mr. Randy Wang's at the sports desk in Culver City. John, the L.A. queen of defund the police, Eunice Hernandez, says approving this police contract will endanger your kids. Who will lose out because we approve this contract? Is it our children's safety as they travel to school? Is it our parks? Is it the 40,000 people who need housing? Well, she is the defund the police movement. Because we are the defund the police people, right? 800-222-KABC is your telephone number, 1-800-222-5222. Well, the poll results are in from those who watched the debate last night. The Republicans had their first presidential debate of the 2024 election in 2023 because the elections never stop and we start so early. It's like selling Christmas ornaments at Target. And according to Nate Silver over at 538, the big winner last night among the participants was Ron DeSantis. Vivek Ramswamy came in second, and then Nikki Haley came in third, Pence came in fourth, then Chris Christie, Tim Scott, Asa Hutchinson, and the guy who screwed his Achilles tendons, the North Dakota governor. He came in dead last, but he didn't get that many opportunities to speak, but he was on painkillers, so that they probably did him a favor. Joining us now to talk about this is the New York Times bestselling author so many times over. I think it's 10 or 11. We always have this talk every time she's on. Many books. They're all good. Read the ball. It's summer. You're going to sit on a plane. Trust me. Ann Coulter, hello. <laughs> hello, John Phillips. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you, too. So it looks like the reviews are in, according to 538, and Ron DeSantis came out the winner. I'm a huge Ron DeSantis fan, I think, on the three or four biggest issues facing the country, crime, immigration, the response to covid um, and all this crazy um, wokeness, diversity, uh, slavery, blackity, black, 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 nonstop. He is head and shoulders above every other candidate. In fact, any conceivable candidate, any politician. Um, having said that, uh, I mean, all the Republicans I thought were fine. I think he did fine. Um, I, I wouldn't say it was a standout performance. And so what I found interesting, I, I had just seen that poll from 538 too. What I find interesting about that is I think that's just the order in which people who are paying attention to politics, and many Americans are, I think that's just how they rank the candidates. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed Ramaswamy um, coming in second, in, for example, in that poll. I've noticed that a lot of young men like Ramaswamy, he's like the bros candidate. Uh, he's a libertarian, he's glib, he talks fast, he is very articulate. Um, I, I was surprised his debate performance wasn't as good as I expected it to be because he is a good talker. Uh, I don't think, I think we've tried the inexperienced businessman and we see that we can't trust them. Um, and that's kind of how I would have ranked ranked the candidates b- before I even saw a debate. I thought they were all fine. Um, the big problem with the debate last night is the moderators and Fox News. They get an F. Um, I can't conceive of worse moderators or a worse forum um, in order to to tell any difference among the among the candidates. Um, starting with the fact that. One hour and 25 minutes in was the first time we got a question on immigration. One hour and 25 minutes. No, before that, we had to talk about climate change and abortion and Trump and January 6th. Um, Because, you know, I'm not hearing enough about Trump and January 6th from the entire rest of the media. We finally get a question about immigration and who does it go to? Um, I'm sorry, I don't mean this in an insulting way, but an utterly irrelevant candidate, Asta Hutchinson. Oh, fantastic, because that's what we need to know. What's Asta's position on immigration? Um, Moreover, uh, it was after that, I believe, they finally get to a question on crime. And I'd say immigration and crime are are pretty much the top issues. 
um, I should put a footnote there and say, um, yes, but in polls, they say inflation, jobs, the economy. Yes, that's true, but there's no way of distinguishing the candidates. They're all going to say we're going to bring jobs back. They're all going to say we're going to drill for energy. They're all going to say Biden has been a disaster. Um, we have to get government spending down. Blah, 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 blah. There are solid, provable differences on immigration, crime, and the COVID response. Um, but no, we don't get that until the very tail end of the debate, um, which had to be cut short, by the way, for a quick question on UFOs. <laughs> and I haven't finished with how bad these these um, can the the moderators work. Okay, among the things I love about Ron DeSantis is his immigration policy <laughs> paper. I, I recommend anyone look it up. And one of the things I just interviewed him on my Substack, by the way, that's a, which was a way better interview than anything you saw in the debate last night. I highly recommend you go to annculter.substack.com. It's short. It's audio only. Um, you can listen to it free now because it's been a week. Uh, it's all about immigration and crime. And oh, my gosh, is he good. Oh, my gosh, is he smart. And he has done it. He doesn't just BS about it like our former Republican president. Um, and one of the things that, that even I hadn't thought of, um, I just want a wall and mass deportations and an end to anchor babies, and, you know, a few little things like that. But in his immigration policy paper, he says the cartels are killing tens of thousands of Americans every year. This is, this is an act of war. And if elected president, I will treat Mexican drug cartels as a terrorist organization, as an enemy organization, and we will send troops into Mexico to shut them down. Uh, stunning, stunning. Oh, please let this man be our president. Now, um, never, never heard a president suggest that. Fabulous idea. Martha McCollum says to him, um, she was one of the bimbo moderators, both of them, total complete bimbos. She says to Ron DeSantis, this is the only other question we got on the border or immigration. Now, if if a president were to deploy the military at the border, do you think, would you approve of that? Do you know anything about the candidate you're interviewing? Just you know, a <laughs> quick glance at their position. Second utter bimbo question by bimbo Brett Baer was, um, again, to DeSantis, which I was just trying to look up the transcript. No one has pointed this out. Maybe I misheard, but I don't think so. And they're reporting the follow-up question, but not the question. He says to Ron DeSantis, oh, and before I go into this, the preface is, um, back when the rest of you were living through Black Lives Matter um, riots and you know police stations being burnt to the ground and statues being to toppled, stores fronts being smashed and looted, uh, we had utter peace in Florida. Why? Because of various various provisions, um, positions that um, and, and laws that that Governor DeSantis implemented. One is um, we already have stand your ground law in Florida. He extended it right now or previously. It applied to your home, to your yard. You don't have to shoot the guy and then drag him into the house. Um, and to your car. That was the law as it existed. He extended it to your place of business. Somebody starts to loot your place of business, you can shoot them. Um, that's why you didn't have any looting in Florida. Um, not to mention we have a very aggressive, not only concealed carry, but now constitutional carry. You don't even have to get the government's position to conceal uh, a gun. Gun. He's invited police uh, who are being oppressed, insulted, and called Nazis um, in other places around the country to come and join a police force in Florida. You get a $5,000 bonus. Um, these are just some of the things he did to ensure. Oh, and he's the only politician in the country who has removed two George Soros prosecutors. So it will not surprise you to learn, John Phillips, that crime in Florida is at a 50 year low under Governor Ron DeSantis. Brett Baer question to Ron DeSantis Governor DeSantis, crime is up in Florida. How do you respond? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Seriously, well, let's. That was the question. He's poor Ron DeSantis. He must have, well, you know, I came prepared for a debate. Well, wasn't expecting that one. Um, and says, he responds by saying, crime's at a 50 year low. And Brett Bear says, well, it's up in Miami, which I don't even <laughs> think is true. 
<laughs> just FYI, I don't think that's true. Um, but um, that's 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 a city. <laughs> There's only so much a governor can do. Maybe it was Miami, Ohio. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I would I would like to fact check the bimbo uh, Fox <laughs> moderator on that. But the main thing is they're talking about global warming, abortion, Trump, January 6th, before we finally get around to immigration. Okay. So wow. I have a Thank I you, have Fox. a theory on that. My theory, and I hate this about cable news, and you've done a lot of cable news in your career, and I assume you're with me on this. Maybe you're not. I don't know. But they have a formula where they have the host, and then on CNN they have a panel of 900 people. On Fox (laughs) they want human cockfighting, where they put someone on the right, someone on the left, and then the host – and no one gets a chance to say anything. You get 45 seconds yes. and then someone starts to interrupt you. Or if you've got a yes. panel of 9,000 people, maybe you get to talk for 45 seconds and then that's it because they have to move yes. on to the next one to get everyone in. When you do yes. that model, no one gets a chance to say anything. And from the point of view of the viewer, you have no idea what the person is trying to say because you're constantly doing formatics and moving from one person yes. to the next. Well, there are certain people on the panel who are more important than others. Just talk to them yes. and let them get their point across. And having this easy bake oven bell that goes off every 45 seconds, there are people you go to dinner with who can't even get their order in in 45 seconds. How are you <laughs> supposed to know about their opinion on the border or crime or the economy or whatever. You don't learn anything in that format, but that's what they do on cable. So that's what they do in these debates because it's the same people producing the debates that produce the cable news shows. Yes. Yes. And you remind me of two other complaints I have with the debate. Um, Again, not the Republicans, every, every one of them, even the ones I disagreed with, they were all pretty good. Um, I was kind of surprised by by Nikki Haley, although I, I very much disagreed with her on on a few points, and I agree with Vivek um, on on one little dispute they had. Um, but one was, I mean, there were too many candidates on the stage. Let's let's, let's start with that. Uh, I'm sorry, we really didn't need Asa Hutchinson, and I liked Doug Berg. I might thought he had a, he was never heard of the guy before, and he had. Um, a few really good answers, and maybe better than anybody else's, at least on, on the abortion question, um, which is irrelevant because it's not a federal issue, which is what he said. Um, but t- too many candidates. This, the people are sneering at this debate saying, oh, it felt like the, um, what did they call the underlings debate or the, the lower <laughs> tier debate that they did last time around? They said that's what it seems like. Well, yeah, okay, let's have, let's have Christy, DeSantis, Tim Scott, um, and Nikki Haley. Let's have them debate. And yes, they'd have a lot more time to talk. Every time Ron DeSantis gave an answer, it was a very, very, very good answer. But you felt like you didn't get the sense that, oh my gosh, he's, he's lapping everybody else. He's head and shoulders above them. Can we have a few more questions to the front runner? And not, no, no, no. Time to go back to Asa Hutchinson. And my second... Um, Absolutely. And I don't know if you were following me right live tweeting it last night. I wasn't really going to, but if you, but the moderators just drove me so crazy. There were such such morons if I have not expressed that clearly enough. Um, and that is no stop with the hand raising. We are not kindergartners. And just what you said, 45 seconds to make a point. No, here you can't even make a point. Raise your hand. And whenever I'm, I'm in an audience and, and somebody says that, you know, how many of you have shoes? I will not raise my hand. Go F yourself. Ask me a question if you want my answer. You know, the only time raise that question should hand. ever be... The only time that question should ever be asked to an adult is if some fat bastard in 1A is having a heart attack and the flight attendant comes over the intercom and says, is there a doctor on board? (laughs) Yes. And then the only one who would raise their hand is Jill Biden. And I don't think that that would help. (laughs) Yes. Yes, because we don't need an explanation there. If you have a question, ask it. An answer is more than raising a hand. We learn nothing from that. And they did that, I think, at least three times. 
Yeah, you know, everyone used to make fun of Larry King because Larry King would have these people on for an hour and he would just let them talk. But you learn mm-hmm. so much more from seeing someone on Larry King for an hour than you do in a two-hour debate with this format. Yes, and something else he did, which is which is interesting and, I don't know, kind of smart. Um, I'm too scared to do it on my Substack interviews. But he would know nothing about the person he was interviewing. <laughs> he did. <laughs> he would get, like, a note card with the person's name, just like, you know... Um, Jerry Seinfeld, comedian. Remember he had that famous exchange with Jerry Seinfeld after after the most watched television show in history, the last the last Seinfeld episode, and Larry King asked him if he had been fired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the he only asked thing me hmm? The only thing funnier than that was when Roseanne Barr started a blog and he'd never heard of blogs before. And she was on there promoting the blog. And he goes, so what are you doing now? And she goes, well, I'm doing a blog. He goes, a blog? What's that? And she's trying to explain it to him. But he goes, is that on the box with the buttons? (laughs) Well, he famously asked me, and those of you familiar with my oeuvre will know this. In my book, Trees, and my third book, oh, this is John Phillips' favorite book. I have a ferocious defense of Senator, Senator Joe McCarthy. Um, no pussyfooting it around. Um, one of the greatest heroic Americans in history. And I have the truth about Joe McCarthy, which none of the other books do. Um, in any event, I was, of course, viciously attacked all over. I, the book had come out, I don't know, three or four weeks earlier. Um, it was, there was just furious denunciations of me every place. Um, in certain circles, McCarthy up until my book Treason, was treated as if he was Adolf Hitler. Um, to give you a, an idea of the tenor of the attacks on this book, and at some point I'm talking about John McCarthy on, on Larry King, and Larry King says, wait, you're not defending Joe McCarthy, are you? <laughs> <laughs> And but Coulter. what's good about that is yeah. you really what you're saying. You really get the person to explain things, and you know it's not like an inside baseball conversation. Well, and my attitude is people are perfectly happy to tell you what they think. You just have to let them. If you let people talk, they'll tell you what they think. Most people aren't shy about yeah. that. But for some reason, they always want the trick question. They want to trick you into saying something yeah. you don't mean. And I don't understand why everything has to be a trick question. That's a really great point. And by the way, the exception to, or at least one glaring exception to the Larry King rule of knowing nothing about the person you're interviewing. I mean, those are just, you know, one hour format. It's a comedian, an author, and an actress, so we're going to, you know, dictate or we're going to find out, you know, what makes this person tick. In a presidential debate, know who the candidates are. <laughs> Ann Coulter, you can get her online at annculter.com, and you have your Substack linked at the website? Yes, I do, annculter.substack.com. It's fantastic. Lots of videos, podcasts, articles. They go up all the time. Ann Coulter, thanks so much for stopping by. Always a pleasure. Good to talk to you, John. Bye-bye. So the Los Angeles City Council, as we told you before, voted to ratify the contract that was struck with the LAPD union, the union that represents LAPD officers. We played some sound for you earlier in the show of Councilwoman Nithya Raman, who opposed the deal, and Councilwoman Amelda Padilla, who supports the deal, but has a difficult time with math. Randy, we have more council members who weighed in on this. All right, Johnny, I'm going to give you a choice here. Is it time for Hugo Soto Martinez or Eunices Hernandez? Let's go with Eunices. All right, here is the abolitionist herself. You know, you can't get well in a cell. Eunices Hernandez and why she opposed this LAPD contract. Colleagues, I believe the issue before us today is a question of equity, of responsible budgeting, of ensuring that our city can adequately serve our 4 million residents. 
I hear from constituents every day who are frustrated with the pace that we deliver our municipal services, and I share their frustrations. Are these it the same constituents that she was worried about criminalizing with catalytic converter thefts? Oh, yeah, we can't throw them in prison for that. We're criminalizing our communities, for heaven's sake. It shouldn't take us seven years to fix a sidewalk. We shouldn't be limited in the number of alleys we can repave. I learned that we only get two alleys per year. Why does she think these are things the city is terrible at because we pay for police? Maybe they're just terrible at that independent. The number of speed humps we can install, the number of street lights we can fix. But we invest over a quarter of our general funds into just one department. And by doing that, we are shortchanging our 50-plus other departments and their ability to deliver on the services that make our communities thrive. You know, if you ask the average person who lives in the city of Los Angeles, even in Council District 1, what would you rather have, police officers or fixing that uprooted sidewalk? They'd pick police officers 100 out of 100 times. I love the cadence of how she speaks. It's almost like it's some kind of slam poetry. This contract is coming before us today despite the lack of clarity on how we will pay for an additional billion dollars in salary costs over the next four years. Oh, now she's a budget hawk. When did these people become budget hawks? This council spends so prolifically on every subject under the sun. But when it comes to policing, suddenly they're Tom McClintock. And you know what? If you care so much about the budget issues, how about you take a 50% pay cut? Because 225 k is too much for you. The financial impact of this contract on our upcoming budgets will be enormous. And we're already fighting for scraps. I do not see how we can responsibly move forward with approving this. Almost every proposal that comes before this body is met with the same question. How will we pay for it? We want to improve pedestrian safety at our schools by adding speed bumps at all of our elementary schools. And we say, how are we going to pay for that? We want to build permanent supportive housing and expand mental health services for our most vulnerable residents. And we say, how are we going to pay for that? Oh, you tax the hell out of us. That's how you pay for it. And by the way, the most vulnerable residents aren't the ones living in the encampments. The most vulnerable residents are the ones paying for the city of Los Angeles to operate, who get hit over the head by the people in the encampments so they can steal their their phones and their wallets to buy meth with. We want to build protected bike lanes so we can safely transition away from car dependency. (laughs) God. We want to build protected bike lanes so we can safely transition away from car dependency and meet our climate goals as a city. Do you think she bikes to work? No. And Pee Wee Herman's dead, so no one bikes to work in Los Angeles. And we say, how are we going to pay for that? We want to add alternative crisis response teams that can serve people who are serving a mental health or behavioral health crises. And we say, how are we going to pay for that? Or, you know, you could just have a police officer who's trained for that. Yeah. How are we going to pay for that? Well, straight jackets aren't that expensive. They're all complaining that they're not able to jack money out of the budget for their pet projects that we know don't work. Right. But those are slush funds. They get to throw that money around in their district. And guess what? If you're a vendor that has business before the city of Los Angeles and a particular council person throws a contract your way, you are more inclined, not less inclined, to kick into their re-election campaign. I'd be real interested to find how much money the founders of Urban Alchemy have been giving Nithia, Unisys, and Hugo. <laughs> but when a nearly $1 billion budget liability is in front of us for one bargaining unit in one department, it doesn't appear that we're asking the same question. Colleagues, how are we going to pay for this? How do we justify approving a contract that depends on the city maintaining vacancies in other departments? How do we justify a 13% salary increase for one MOU when we have city employees who are barely, barely making livable wages? We can't give the cops a raise because we need to give the janitors a raise. No, the reason we're doing this is because the people who pay the bills don't feel safe. That's why. How do we justify the pace at which we can respond to the service requests from our constituents? Where will we sacrifice as a city? Who will lose out because we approve this contract? Is it our children's safety as they travel to school? Is it our parks? Is it the 40,000 people who need housing? Will it take us... That's right. L.A. is such a dump because we have a police force. What world is she living in? I think she also has family members that have danced around with the public justice system. Will it take us 14 years instead of seven to fix a sidewalk? 
Accepting this contract without real deliberation, without the potential financial implications of the 20 plus contracts that are still being negotiated with our labor partners feels irresponsible. And it is not a decision that I can justify to myself or my constituents. So I'll be voting no on today's item, and I hope you will join me. Thank you so much for all the work you all put into this. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, colleagues. Oh, yeah, she gets an ovation from the nuts that are in the galley. Everyone else gets cursed out except her. Yeah. No, they're her people. 